Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you so much, Mel. I'm Vic. I'm an alcoholic. Happy to be here with you guys today. Um, for reference to any newcomers, my sobriety date is February 10th, 2019. I just celebrated two years of sobriety um, to the ladies with 335 and 37 days. That's huge. It's huge. It's easier. I don't want to say easier. It's it's kind of like the same way my alcoholism was on autopilot. As long as I keep doing this, my recovery most days feels like it's on autopilot, but those first beginning days, I was like learning how to exist in like a totally different world. And, you know, when I, when I was asked to speak, I had like an, had an option of steps to speak on. And, uh, you know, the sixth step is genuinely, I don't want to say like a favorite. It's my, it's my most cherished step because in the way that I continue to remain sober, um, my sixth step for me is really the make it or break it. Because if I'm not willing to do something, the rest of it really doesn't matter. And when I first showed up in Alcoholics Anonymous, it wasn't a matter for me of just don't drink and make a meeting. Um, I couldn't do that because I was that page 21 alcoholic that didn't have a choice anymore. I had lost this right to choose. And I came in for four months and I was willing to come to the meeting, but that was all that I was told to do at first was just come to the meeting. And I was willing to make the meeting. I didn't hear the message of what I was supposed to be doing because the meeting wasn't keeping me sober. And I continued to drink before and after every single meeting for four months. And it almost killed me. And, um, you know, thank God I came across this woman who said to me, you know, she said, the meetings are excellent. You, you, you come there, you talk about what's going on in your life. You learn about this program, but are you willing to sit down and read this book and do these steps with me? Because that's, that's the solution. That's where the solution is. Um, she carried a message of depth and weight, the depth of, right. And, and it talks about, I can't see the truth from the false, right. I can't see the truth that I've lost the power of choice and I can't see the false that this time is not going to be different. And she she qualified me, or I should say she had me qualify myself. She opened up to page 44, and she said, if when you honestly want, you find you can't quit drinking entirely, or when drinking, you can't control the amount you take in. And she was really asking me if I had an obsession of the mind and an allergy of the body, and was I willing to answer that honestly? So willingness, right, is my sixth step principle. And that's been, you know, that's been necessary for me from day one. Because if I wasn't willing, I wouldn't have even shown up in the meeting. If I wasn't willing, I wouldn't have even had a conversation with another woman. If I wasn't willing, I wouldn't have been looking for that woman whose whole deportment shouted that she was a woman with a real answer, that she was armed with the facts about herself. Because there was a lot of women in the room that you know, had had 12th step experience and they'd had a, they found a God of their understanding, but I really didn't care how people spoke. I care about how they lived. I cared about how you lived when you left the meeting, because I knew that I too could show up in a meeting and I could put on a performance. That wasn't fine. I was very, I was very uh, acquainted with being the actor. I had a lot of experience being the actor and I knew that there were people that could show up and they could act their way through sobriety, but were people willing to live as honestly as they said they were speaking. And that was really important to me. And, you know, this woman lived the way that she spoke. And I knew that she lived the way that she spoke because I had actually heard about her through a friend of mine, someone who was constitutionally incapable of getting honest. She was also a real alcoholic that couldn't be without a spiritual solution and when she let up on this program of action this illness took her out and i knew who this woman was that sponsored me because this was the same woman that had sponsored her and i realized that the willingness to be honest was going to be the only thing that was going to keep me alive at this point because if i honestly was not willing to keep moving forward nothing was going to change in my life 
So willingness was even required for me, right? Like I had to be entirely willing from before I even showed up really in a meeting before I even showed up with a sponsor working through the steps. So for me, like the, the sixth step is so close to my heart because entirely willing, I had to be entirely willing in every single step. I had to be entirely willing to admit defeat. I had to be entirely willing to be convinced that alcohol had beaten me into a state of reasonableness. I had to be entirely willing to see that it was a 24 hour job and no part of that was going to stop magically just because I wanted it to. The alcohol was my master. I had to be willing to see that it demanded a debt of me that I was never going to pay. Like the, like, like my sixth step was still present in my first, but the thing is, right. Was that I had to be entirely willing in a sixth step for God to remove, you know, these, these defects of character, but God let me hold on to the ones that were still useful to me. You know, I got sober on a character defect. I got sober because, you know, a gentleman that I had absolutely no business being involved with said to me, when you're drinking, you're intolerable. And he said, you're not going to show up tomorrow sober. Not possible. So now he has challenged me. And I'm like, well, now I have to prove you wrong. I have to. I have to. You could not. I have to be right. Because when I'm not right, I don't feel safe. So I, I need to make sure that I'm secure. And I obviously couldn't possibly allow myself to look like a fool. So I, I have to show up sober tomorrow. And that was the beginning of my my journey into to sobriety was truthfully a, a character defect I was not entirely willing to get rid of, but I was entirely willing to utilize that defect in a way that I didn't know would save my life later on. So today, when I really think about my sixth step and what it's asking me, right, and, and the book talks about, you know, I, do I look at these defects that that are objectionable? And, you know, it really depends on the day that you're asking me. Because sometimes the things that I think are objectionable one day, I look back and I'm like, this saved my skin more times than I can count. Defect saved my life more than anything else. But there's another thing that I've realized that happens with me in defects is I can see that some of them really are objectionable and that they don't, they don't really serve me. You know, I am, I'm very skilled in emotional terrorism. I, I very much enjoy that. If I can be an emotional terrorist and I can terrorize you, that for me is is a fantastic pastime, but that doesn't really serve a purpose to me, to God, to others. It's pretty much useless. But there's this thing, right, about being entirely willing is, one, if you take these defects, what are you going to replace them with? Because I have already assigned who I am in this world to who I get to be with these defects. What are you going to replace these things with? Because I was, I was scared. What do you mean entirely ready? Like, who am I supposed to be? Because what I realized is, you know, there, there's so many of us, and, you know, I'll speak for myself. Like, I showed up in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I had already made a decision. God was for good people. I wasn't good. This is who I was. And if you didn't want to have to deal with me, you should probably just stay the hell out of my way. And this was kind of how I wanted to walk about the world, truly, because I was terrified to let people get close to me because vulnerability meant that I was going to get hurt. And if I got hurt, then I couldn't handle it because, you know, my whole internal world is unmanageable. So I wasn't entirely ready to let things go. Why? Because the devil you know is better than the devil you don't. I didn't know how to exist with things. You wanted to replace these defects with assets that were going to bring people closer to me that meant I had to do things for other people like this wasn't how I functioned it was like I was being asked to be someone completely different and that didn't feel safe to me because I had already gotten very safe and very familiar in a lot of dysfunction you know thank god the word fun is in dysfunction because you know, to my delusion, I really thought that I was enjoying life the way that it was. And when our book talks about, you know, I, I thought that my alcoholic life was the only normal one. Was I entirely willing to live a different life? No, I didn't come into AA willing to get sober. I didn't even want to be sober. I wanted everyone to just leave me alone. I was going to take some time away. My tolerance was going to drop and then I was going to get back out there 
and it was going to be a grand old time. I was basically going to come into you guys and you guys were going to give me, you know, some sobriety through osmosis. It was going to rub off. And then I was going to be able to go back out and it was going to all of a sudden be calibrated into this normal, this normal person. Because the idea of entirely changing was terrifying to me. And today, you know, today to me, when I look at step six, it's really, uh, how much space am I willing to make in my life? How much more space am I willing to make for God? How much more space am I willing to make for others? Because step six is a space maker. It's also the space maker, the grace maker. It's the, what am I really willing to do? And there's this really excellent um, reference to kind of step six and seven in the 12 and 12, it talks about the step that separates from the, we'll say children from adults for the sake of uh, neutrality. And, you know, there's, there's another piece of literature that talks about it. And it says, you know, step six is the best way it can be explained is there's people who adopt entirely adopt a new way of living, a new way of being a new way of showing up in the world. And then there's people who just want to do enough to make the pain go away. And then they wait until the pain gets great enough. And then they'll do enough to make the pain go, go away again. And this was really where they started to differentiate the types of people, like these two types of people that can kind of exist in this world of sobriety. And this book references them as a, uh, is kind of like the winners and the losers. And, you know, I'm not too fond of the winners and the losers, but what I really think about that is how free do you want to be? There's people who are okay with having a, a kind of satisfactory level of freedom. And that for me is not freedom. I want as much freedom as I can possibly have because I already know what it feels like to not have a choice in my life. I spent a long time living without a choice in my life. So my sixth step today is how free do you want to be? And what are you willing to do about it? Because talk is cheap. What, what's the action that you're actually willing to put in to continue to clear the space? Because I could find out all the truth that I want about myself in a four and a five if I'm not willing to clear some of that stuff out to make space. But that also means that I have to see where I wasn't a victim. I was a volunteer. I have to see where it wasn't about me. It was never about me. I just needed it to be about me. So I had a reason to feel bad for me. I had to see that there was a lot of things in my life that could have been different, but I wasn't willing to be different. So it couldn't have been different. That there were a lot of things that allowed me to carry on a narrative that allowed me to stay in the delusion that life was continuously happening to me. It was a lot easier for me to not be responsible for things. It was a lot easier to not be accountable for things. It was a lot easier to not have to take ownership over the things that I'd done and who I had been and the way that I treated people. It was a lot easier for me to just turn a blind eye to what alcoholism does when it lives through me. Because it was a lot easier for me to just blame it on the alcohol too. But unmanageability for me was something that took place with or without alcohol. I did not need alcohol in order to make absolutely horrific choices. I did not need alcohol to have a complete disregard for other humans. That wasn't necessary, but was it present? Absolutely. So it was really easy for me to want to kind of look at step six. Initially, I was like, oh, I was like entirely ready to remove these things. Wonderful. People are going to like me. I'm going to be a great person. This is going to be this fantastic opportunity. And it had nothing to do with that. Because Alcoholics Anonymous has nothing to do with me. I show up here. God gives me some grace. There's a few things I might lose, but my life is spared. And then what am I willing to do to be of maximum use to God and other people? Or do I continue to go along the way and treat my sobriety and treat my life like a checklist? Because it's what I'm supposed to do. Or do I actually adopt a new way of being? Because it's not about what I do. It's who... It's how God would have me be, right? It's like who I be. Like, who do I be in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous? Who do I be when nobody is around? Like, like what is the being in me that God would have me live through? And am I willing to do that when nobody's looking? Am I willing to do that when I'm by myself? Am I willing to do that no matter how frustrated I get? Because my sixth step still becomes this, my 
my relationship and my true faith, my true reliance on a power greater than myself is really determined when those defects sound like a much better option than being how God would have me be. When I'm frightened, when I'm scared, when there's financial insecurity, when I'm angry, when I feel like I'm justified in the way that I feel, when I want to snap back, when I want to not answer the phone call, when I'm exhausted, when I'm depleted, when I'm tired, when I don't want to be inconvenienced by my sobriety, when I don't want to hear another alcoholic call me to complain about more things, when I don't want to do whatever it is that I've been asked to do by whoever it is that asked me to do it, who do I be then? What am I willing to do when it's uncomfortable? Because if I ran around and I started to define the way that my sobriety looks when things are great and things are good and I'm in a good mood and I feel good, then that would mean that my sobriety was about me. And I heard someone once say, they said, you know, my, my spiritual fitness really depends on my willingness to be inconvenienced by my sobriety. You know, Bill's story, he says that faith has to work in and through us 24 hours a day or else we perish. So when my phone rings at five in the morning, I'm entirely willing to answer it. You know, when another woman says, I really need to get through these steps because I don't have another solution and I'm going to drink. I say, yes, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what's on my plate. Because I was the kind of alcoholic that I drank at five in the morning. I was the alcoholic that drank any time of day. I was the alcoholic that didn't have another solution. I was the alcoholic that when I said I was struggling, what I really meant was that I was afraid I was going to die. And, and there's a certain language that happens in Alcoholics Anonymous. And, you know, I, I hear it often when women come in or men, just when newcomers come in. And it's this kind of confusion. And it's this, I'm willing to do, but I don't know what I need to do. And then I'm, I was given the steps. And the thing was, I wasn't entirely willing to allow the steps to be as simple as they really were. I felt like I needed to complicate more. Because if it's not unmanageable and chaotic, I kind of don't know what to do. So part of my sixth step is like, have I built up enough self-esteem, enough self-worth, enough self-love that I will allow there to be space for life to just be okay and to be calm at times and to not have to make it crazy? And, you know, I I get to run my own business today, which is really cool and I'm running this program and this woman came to me the other day, you know, nothing I do is related to alcoholism. I, I very have a very clear boundary with that. Um, but this woman said to me, she said, you know, the only reason that unworthiness has ever existed for me is because I held the space for it to be there. And it kind of blew my mind. Like the only reason that the way that I think about these worst parts of me these parts of me I'm entirely unwilling to, to make space in or let, or let go of, right? The only reason they still exist is because I hold a space for them. And that for me is like where step six is, it's, it's trying to make room for grace. It's trying to make room for things that I may not think I deserve, for undeserved kindness, for undeserved un opportunities. So for me, my my, my lack of willingness to allow there to be space for good things is basically saying, like, I think I know better, God. I think I deserve all of these qualities that just reinforce the fact that I'm really unworthy and I'm really not a good person and I really don't deserve love and I don't deserve things to be good and I don't know what freedom feels like. I know what the bondage of self feels like. So... I think that I'm just going to stay with this. I'm not entirely ready. And when she said this to me, like, th like this is what was playing in my head because, you know, I, I have the privilege of being in AA today. And when people say anything, my brain just thinks totally differently. And uh, I said, the only reason my defects exist is because I continue to hold space from them. And I remember I've spoken on the sixth step before and somebody kind of caught on to my language. And they said, in the beginning, you were talking about God taking these things from you. And then towards the end of you speaking, you talked about you giving them away. When I realized that God is just trying to help me make space for something better, doesn't that mean that like, maybe I deserve to have it. I deserve to have it. Did like, haven't I suffered enough for me? You know, and they talk about like, 
I'm not supposed to make an amends to myself in like a ninth step. I don't think that I need to. If I make an honest sixth step, a sixth step can be the greatest amends you can ever make to yourself. Are you entirely willing for God to just give you grace? Are you entirely willing for God to replace these things with things that you wouldn't even imagine that you deserve? Like for me, my sixth step is like, are you entirely willing to believe that you are just a worthy human just because you are? Because God's not trying to put more mess in my life. I can create that all on my own. If God, if the, the entire purpose of these steps in this book is to enable me to affect a, a conscious contact with a higher power that's going to solve my problem, why would I think that this higher power is trying to put more mess when it's asking me to take away all these things that aren't serving me or others? And it's going to be replaced with things that I get to go out and do esteemable things and continue to build self-esteem. Because the more I've allowed God to take, the more God has given me. And I believe that that is just the, the, the energetic exchange of the way that the world works. And I have a choice. I get this choice in how hard I want to kind of hold on to things. And I heard this woman once say, anything I ever turned over to God, I turned it over with claw marks. And the thing is, is that for me, if I'm still not willing to turn some stuff over in a sixth step, then I need to acknowledge what it is that I'm afraid of. Because if I'm not willing to give it over to God, there's something that I missed in a fears inventory. There's something that I missed around why I was so caught up in self-reliance that God reliance didn't seem like the better option. And for me, it's I'm afraid that God's not going to replace this with something. I'm afraid I don't know who I'm going to be without these defects. I'm afraid that whatever happens after this, I'm going to be vulnerable. I'm afraid that I'm going to get hurt. And I had to look at that. I have to start to look at these things. Because even though, you know, there's, there's this kind of programming that we have. We're kind of like supercomputers. And the cool thing about being an alcoholic is that we're a certain kind of crazy that wakes up every day and is like, I am going to choose trauma. I'm going to wake up in the morning and I'm going to choose to traumatize myself pretty much. And I'm going to see how long I can do this. And the thing about it, right, is it, it starts to code these things that we have expectations of the way that things are going to happen. And these defects really become defenses, which become survival mechanisms. I don't know if I can, I am afraid that I can't survive in the world. Why? Because I have all this programming that tells me of all the bad stuff that's going to happen. Why? Because I'm used to waking up and choosing trauma. And at a certain point, I'm not going to wake up in the morning and be like, I really think that I'm going to wake up today and just welcome all the blessings. Because I probably don't believe that blessings know how to find me. So then I have to look at my third step. Was I really convinced? Was I really convinced? Because it, it specifically tells me, being convinced then we are at step three. If I'm not convinced, I'm not at step three. So what was I not convinced about, about the way that I ran my life, the way that self ran my life, I was constantly in collision. And if I'm over here resisting grace, resisting everything else that gets to come, if I'm resisting the freedom that I can get on the other side of this, what is it about me that's afraid to be free? What is it about it that makes it feel safer to be in some sort of bondage of self? What is it about my alcoholism that feels safe? Because if I still feel safe in alcoholism, then I probably haven't made a solid step one. And that's why for me, like step six is, it's, it's the make it or break it. It's really the, it's where all of my growth resides today. And once I got really clear, you know, when I, when I came in and I finally got to like a third step, like I could have never made it. For me personally, this is my experience, very, very specific to just mine um because i want i don't want anyone to think that that you have to have a, an experience that looks like anyone else's in order for this to work for you you don't your experience is going to look like yours it's absolutely not going to look like mine and i don't want it to look like mine because my higher power might get you drunk that's my truth your higher power might get me drunk i don't know that's why it's, it's as i understand it but you know i i really made a third step decision when i was convinced that my life being about me was never going to work. I was convinced that if I wanted to be useful to other people, my way wasn't going to work. That was my third step in being convinced. And it was when I realized 
Alcoholics Anonymous had nothing to do with me. So in a sixth step, if I'm entirely ready, if I'm entirely willing to give these things over, you know, I remember that everything that I'm asked to do that, you know, and, and it, the, the simplest way that I can kind of explain how this works for me today, and it works kind of in my mind very quickly, here's a circumstance. Am I entirely willing to do this? Hell no. Absolutely not, I'm not. I could care less about it. That's the God's honest truth. Is me doing this going to benefit the next woman? Absolutely. Am I willing to do it? You bet your ass. There is nothing that I would be willing to do in here if it was just about me. Because I, as a real alcoholic, there is no bottom that is going to satisfy me. You know, they talk about in step one as alcohol is the rapacious creditor in uh, the 12 and 12. I'm never going to be able to pay that debt. I'm never going to be able to pay that debt, right? And it talks about, in the doctor's opinion, the cycle continues. Because what I realized about, you know, step one doesn't really require willingness. It requires me to really, like, see the, like, am I willing to see the delusion? That's, that's for me, is where, like, the willingness came in there for me. You know, but it never talks about me hitting a bottom. It talks about me going in a circle. It says that I'm restless, irritable, and discontent without a substance, and then I want the sense of ease and comfort that comes at once by taking a few drinks. So then I take a drink and then the allergy kicks in and then I go through the spree and then I'm filled with guilt, shame, remorse, and fear. And then I make a firm resolution and I'm going to swear it off. And then that peculiar mental twist comes in with that delusion that I'm going to control and enjoy this and the insanity's back. And I see other people drinking with impunity. You have no consequences. I don't want consequences. Life is treating me unfairly. Next thing you know, I'm restless, irritable, and discontent. And I want the sense of ease and comfort. And then I'm going to take a drink and then the allergy and then the spree. And then I come out, guilt, shame, and remorse. And then I have a firm resolution. And then the, tw the little twist in my mind. And then the insanity and then control and enjoy. And then I'm back, restless, irritable. I keep going in a circle. Me not willing to get sober has absolutely nothing. Like willingness to get sober when I'm living step one has absolutely nothing to do with it. It tells me I don't get a choice. I don't get that choice. And that's why for me, it doesn't matter if I, anything I'm asked to do in life or in Alcoholics Anonymous is going to benefit me. Why? Because there's a part of me that gets very comfortable living on that hamster wheel. There's a part of me that's like, I'll totally settle for this carousel. I stopped willing to, I stopped being willing to settle for the carousel and to see the delusion when the alcohol stopped working. It was when the solution stopped working for me. It was no matter how much I drank, I was still just dying inside. I was just absolutely torn apart and dead inside. And the thing is, if you had asked me, did I want to get sober for me yet? I didn't. I didn't because I was so afraid of what life was going to be like without alcohol. And then when I did start it, and I got to that third step that asked me if I was convinced, and I realized it wasn't about me, I was willing to do it for me so that I could help you, so that I could help the next person, that I could be there for the next woman. Because my sixth step tells me now that I get two choices. I get one choice that says, when someone comes to me, and asks what my experience is with this situation that I am being presented with, I get two options. My first option is to say, I have no idea because I wasn't willing to do that. My second option is to say, yeah, that really sucked, but this is exactly how I handled it. This is how God carried me through. These are the women that I went to that supported me. Here are some phone numbers. I don't have, or if it's not something that I experienced, it gives me the humility, it gives me the willingness, it gives me the honesty to be like, I'm so sorry you're going through that, my love. I don't have the experience with it. Here's a long list of phone number of other women you can call and you can ask their experience because I'm willing to know that I am not going to save anyone today. I'm willing to know that nobody necessarily saved me. I'm willing to know that I will take so much credit for God's work, but I'm also willing to know that I have a choice in how I co-create my life and I co-create my freedom because God will carry me through it but I have to be entirely willing to show up for it. God does not create miracles or magic or grace or mercy in my life today without my help. I get supported in every single thing that I do. 
I am not absent from support in this process, right? And it says, once I align my thinking, I can employ my mental faculties. After all, God gave me a brain for a reason, right? In my 11th step. So I am entirely willing to understand that this is an, a divine orchestration that I have a choice. And if I'm going to show up for it, I don't get a choice if I'm going to drink. I got a choice in what I'm willing to allow God to make space for it in my life today. And I hope that whatever it is, is that it does make me infinitely more useful to God and other people. And, you know, part of that is that I have to realize that some of the things that I can be willing for God to make space for and give me grace. You know, one of my friends, she once, she once shared and she blew me away with the statement. She said, sometimes grace is the ray of light. Sometimes grace is the hurricane. Am I willing to see that even when I get a large steaming pile of crap in life, even in sobriety, it's trying to increase my threshold for gratitude. It is trying to increase my threshold to realize that although I may have this, my life was still spared. I may have this and it may make no sense to me now, but do I have faith that in hindsight, this is going to make perfect sense, right? Do I realize that this isn't about me? This is how my experience may benefit others. And, and with that, right, like I realize that sometimes grace is the fact that I do get what feels like more than I can handle. And then somehow I get through it and I'm like, wow, like, God, you really walk through that with me because I've survived 100% of my worst days. And somehow I'm here to talk to you about me, my life, my experience with whatever it is. So for me, that tells me that if I have an expectation that the grace and the space that I'm given is only going to be filled with wonderful things and it's always going to be good and it's always going to be easy, then I'm probably in for a rude awakening. So I am entirely willing for life to put whatever difficulties in my path I may need because it's going to be of maximum benefit to God and other people. And I'm willing to grow in understanding and effectiveness because I'm not going to be able to get through this life with any sort of wisdom or any sort of real gratitude and appreciation unless I allow God to carry me through these things, right? 10 step promise tells me I will be placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. It doesn't say I will arrive there or that I'm going to walk over and sit down in this place of neutrality. I'm going to be placed. So I have to trust that wherever I am is where God placed me for some reason. And I'm willing to have that faith that that's what it's for. And I'm willing to trust that even when and if defects come up for me or defenses or whatever we want to call them, it's not because they come up like whack-a-mole. It's because there's either something I have to do to screw up because there's a lesson that God needs me to learn, or it's something that is benefiting somebody else. And I don't always have to know about it. I am willing to not have to have the answers to everything today because self-knowledge really never saved me then. It didn't save me now. So it's really, I'm willing to just trust that wherever I am is where I'm meant to be, that whatever I say is what God intends to come out of my mouth, and that whoever I'm meant to help will hear my message. And if they're not, I trust, I'm willing to believe that there is another member of Alcoholics Anonymous that will carry the message to the person that I can't, because I try to carry this message. I'm willing to believe that it is my responsibility to try. It is not my responsibility to cure anyone, to fix anyone, to save anyone. I just show up and I share what God has done for me and what God has replaced in the space that I have allowed there to be made because I have, I have this choice there to be entirely willing for God to just clear it out and fill it with whatever it is that's going to be useful, even if I don't understand it. And in my experience in doing that, um, you know, I've been given a life that I really don't understand how it gets to be this good. Um, but I'm just extremely grateful for it. So I'm going to be quiet. I thank you all for having me here today. I will drop my email and my number in the chat for any ladies that would like to connect. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.